afternoon. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Erin Payton, and I'm the Executive Director of the 19th Century Charitable Association, which is located in Oak Park, Illinois. Our mission is strengthening our community through learning, giving, and sharing your landmark building. We're so happy to have you here. We have a wonderful program. And uh, before we get started with it, just going to let you know that there will hopefully be time for a Q&A at the end. So if you do have a question for Jim, you can put it in our Q&A or our chat. And if there is time, I will unmute you and you can ask the question yourself. So now I'm going to bring to the program, Diane Moses, our program chair. Hi, Diane. Hi, hello. Um, Jim Madigan retired in February, 2019 after serving 25 years as the deputy director of the Oak Park Public Library. He is a published poet and adjunct professor in the humanities at Illinois Institute of Technology, where he teaches a course, Songs of Justice and Injustice. He has been an Oak Park resident for over 40 years and his daughter was one of our scholarship winners. The great jazz singer, Billie Holiday, will always be associated with the song, Strange Fruit. This is especially relevant even today. Please, let's give a nice virtual welcome to Jim Madigan. Good afternoon. As Diane said, uh, my name is Jim Madigan. And uh, today, the program that we're going to look at is what I call the stories of strange fruit. And we're gonna look at four different stories. We're gonna talk about the song. We're gonna talk about the singer. We're gonna talk about the song writer. And we're gonna talk about the inspiration for the song. So what I'd like to do is uh, to get, to, to start off by listening to the song that Time Magazine called the Song of the Century in their December 31st, 1999 edition. And while I play this song, I'd like you to imagine, I'd like you to imagine that you are at the Cafe Society. It's March, 1939, New York City on West 4th Street. The Cafe Society calls itself the wrong place for the right people. And it was founded in 1938 by a man named Barney Josephson. And it was New York's first truly integrated nightclub. Barney Josephson established Cafe Society in order to be an American version of the political cabarets that he had experienced in Europe and he chose to showcase African-American performers. He tried to turn things upside down a little bit. For example, the doorman, instead of being in a uh, uniform or in a tuxedo, was in tattered clothing. The murals on the wall at the Cafe Society were comments, satirical comments on high society. It prided itself on treating black and white patrons equally well. So now you're going to imagine a 23 year old Billie Holiday. She has just completed, you know, her set of about 45 minutes. And you notice that the room has darkened. The wait staff has all moved to the back of the room. There is only a spotlight on Billie Holiday. And when she finishes the song, the show is gonna be over. There's no encore. She does not come back for applause. Barney Josephson had choreographed this song because he understood the song's greatness. He understood its power. He understood its impact. And rather than applauding, he wanted people in the audience to think.
silent trees bear a strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the sound and breeze. Strains hanging from the poplar trees. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather. For the wind to sun, for the sun to run, for the tree to drop. That was Billie Holiday singing Strange Fruit. And that song was written by this man, Abel Mirapol. Mirapol wrote under the name of Lewis Allen. He was born in 1903, which made him 34 years old when he wrote the poem that he first called uh, bitter fruit, not strange fruit, bitter fruit. He was born of Russian Jewish immigrants, and he worked as an English teacher at DeWitt Clinton High School for 17 full years, and that school was in the Bronx. As it happened, he had gone to DeWitt Clinton High School before getting a BA from the City Colleges of New York, and then going and getting his master's in English from Harvard. While he was a teacher at DeWitt Clinton High School, he ended up teaching James Baldwin and Neil S Simon. Under his name, Abel Miracle, he was a member of the Communist Party USA. He was a social activist and he was a writer under his name, Lewis Allen, of poems, stories, and songs. He wrote under that name Lewis Allen in order to uh, honor uh, the two sons he had hoped for, who were born stillborn, but they had picked the names out for, uh, for those. When Mirapol wrote the poem that became Strange Fruit, he first published it in a union magazine called The New York Teacher in 1937. And then he published it in the Marxist journal, The New Masses. He was at a summer camp, and a summer camp attended by left-wingers and union activists. 
And he shared the poem with people there and he was encouraged to put the poem to music. So after setting the poem to a simple melody, his wife, Anne, and a, a singer named Laura Duncan, who was a left-wing singer who often sang, who ended up singing with the Weavers on stage. Uh, Laura Duncan performed this song at Madison Square Garden at a fundraiser for the Republican side of the Spanish Civil War. And for those of you who are, who are in Oak Park, uh, you'll know that uh, the Republican side was the side that Hemingway paid particular attention to, uh, raised funds and acted as a journalist uh, covering the Republicans. In the crowd at Madison Square Garden uh, was a man named Robert Gordon. And he worked for the Cafe Society uh, nightclub. He suggested to Abel Mirapol that he meet Barney Josephson. He thought that the song that Abel Mirapol had written was perfect for the Cafe Society's star singer, Billie Holiday. So Mirapol played the song for Josephson and for Holiday. And there are differing accounts as to uh, exactly uh, what happened next. Abel Mirapol in his uh, memoirs, he wrote that he did not think that Billie Holiday was too impressed with the song. The band leader named Frankie Newton, he remembered that Billie Holiday thought that it was a hell of a damn good song. Arthur Herzog, a songwriter, claimed that uh, the band arranged arranger, Danny Mendelssohn, rewrote some of the music in order to make it uh, fit Billie Holiday's style. In her own ghost-written autobiography, Lady Sings the Blues, Billie Holiday said that she co-wrote the song. However, on stage, she never made that claim. Sometimes she said it was written for her. And in a certain way, it truly was. What is known is that Billie Holiday had tested the song at a party and it went over well. And so she agreed to add it to her act. It was an immediate success at the nightclub. Mirapol wrote after Billie Holiday's first performance of Strange Fruit, at the Cafe Society, quote, she gave a startling, most dramatic and effective interpretation, which could jolt an audience out of its complacency everywhere. This was exactly what I wanted the song to do and why I wrote it. So you may ask, what was the motivation for Abel Mirapol to write this song? When I teach this in uh, class, I give what's known as a trigger warning because you're going to see a photograph that's uh, by its very nature, unpleasant. So uh, here is a photograph of a lynching and it was this photograph that Abel Mirapol saw that caused him to uh, write Strange Fruit. Marion, Indiana, August 7th, 1930. Marion is a town in a little northeast of Indianapolis, midway between Indianapolis and Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, I would imagine that some people in the audience have uh, gone by there passed by. In 1930, there were 25,000 people living in, uh, living in the town. The two men that were hanging were Thomas Ship and Abram Smith. On August 7th, three black men, Ship, Abram Smith, and James Cameron 
were being held in the uh, local jail on charges of killing a white man and raping his girlfriend. And a crowd of 5,000 people who had sledgehammers broke through the jail walls and they dragged Ship and Abram uh, and Smith out of the jail and hung them. James Cameron, who was not hung, was 16 years old at the time. He was pulled out of his cell, but two people in the crowd, a white woman and a white man, shouted out that Cameron had nothing to do with the crime. And so the crowd unbelievably released him. A local photographer, Lawrence Bertler, took the photograph that I showed you. And he reported that he sold thousands of copies of this photograph in the following 10 days after the lynching. So what do you imagine that mostly freshman engineering students at the Illinois Institution, Institute of Technology think when I discuss this song and this photograph? Well, I'll tell you what they say. They noticed that the white people in the audience are all dressed up. You know, you see a man with a tie, they've got hats on, dresses. It looks like they're posing for the picture and in fact they are. The students who are freshmen are astonished that women or children are in the crowd. That it looks like the hanged men have been beaten. One person said, this is photographic evidence. Was anyone arrested? Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, students say, I never learned anything about this in high school. So the, some of the facts of lynching are that lynching was sometimes planned social events that were advertised in the newspaper in advance. It used to be that photographers sold the photos and made them into postcards. And that was so prevalent in the United States that in 1908, 22 years before this, the US Postmaster General had to come out with a ruling banning uh, sending postcards like this through the mail. And then finally, one of the things that uh, students learned is that uh, lynchings only, did not only take place in the South. Now, in the song that references, you know, Southern trees, but Marion, Indiana is not in the South. So the more one studies lynching, the more odd things that we discover. So one of the things I discovered really within the last couple of months is I, I read an article by a woman named Eula Bliss in the 2008 edition of the Iowa Review. Eula Bliss wrote a story of her research into the telephone pole. In 1889, the New York Times wrote of the war on the telephone pole. Uh, people in the United States, many of them did not like telephone poles. It, 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 uh, it, it was a blight on the landscape and a lot of people didn't like the new technology anyway. But one of the things that she discovered as she was doing her research is that there were dozens and dozens of articles because she was doing a, a search on telephone poles in the New York Times and she'd come up articles that were about a lynching that took place. In 1889, the same year that uh, the New York Times wrote about uh, the war on telephone poles, 
Uh, black men were hung from telephone poles in lynchings in Mississippi, in Kansas, West Virginia, Texas, but also in Belleville, Illinois, and in Danville, Illinois. So one of the things is that in the blues tradition, and Billie Holiday sings both within the blues and jazz tradition, uh, there's quite a number of songs in the blue tradition about Jim Crow. And Jim Crow, of course, is that system, kind of an informal system of local laws and customs that enforced racial segregation, particularly in the South. And it was enacted and came into being after Reconstruction. And it lasted until 1965, when the uh, Voting Rights and the Civil Rights Act were passed. But blues singers did not uh, sing about lynching. That was a taboo su subject. And frankly, they were afraid of being lynched. If we look at the next slide, these are other anti-lynching songs. And you'll see that the very first one on the list is Supper Time by Irving Berlin. And that song was written for a Broadway show called Thousands Cheer in 1933. Now, Irving Berlin had some similarities with Abel Mirapol. Uh, both of them were uh, sons of Russian Jewish immigrants. He wrote this song, Supper Time, to be sung by Ethel Waters. And it's important to recognize that even in this song, the lyrics, lyrics are not explicit at all. Um, it's the setting on the stage from which you can see that, uh, that they're talking about uh, a lynching. Um, you see two songs on here, one by Woody Guthrie and Desolation Row by Bob Dylan. And there's a relationship here. And that relationship is that uh, Woody Guthrie's father participated in a lynching in 1911, the year before Woody Guthrie was born. Um, in Okima, Oklahoma. Uh, Woody heard this story numbers of times. Back in 1911, Woody's father was a uh, member of the Ku Klux Klan. And they, uh, they lynched uh, a woman and her son. Um, Woody heard this story. He wrote another story uh, called Don't Kill My Baby and My Son, which tells that exact story of his father. And in there, it, uh, it has um, the line, I saw a picture on a postcard, three bodies hanging to sway in the wind. His, his uh, song, Hang Not, Slip Not, has the lyrics, did you ever lose your father on a hangnut? They hang him from a pole, they shot him full of holes. Bob Dylan uh, fashioned himself after Woody Guthrie in his earliest days. And he has something in common with Woody in this regard as well. And that is that in June of 1920, Abram Zimmerman, Bob Dylan's father, was eight years old, and he witnessed the lynching of three black men who worked for a traveling circus in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, not far from Hibbing, where Bob Dylan uh, and his family uh, lived when Bob was born. This story also was passed down and so Dylan, in writing his song, Desolation Row, begins that song this way. 
They're selling postcards of the hanging. They're printing the passports brown. The beauty parlor is filled with sailors. The circus is in town. This is a direct reference, hanging and circus, a direct reference to um, the hanging that his father witnessed as an eight-year-old. So just thinking back to uh, both Guthrie and Dylan mentioning postcards, uh, recalling that the photographer in Marion, Indiana sold thousands of copies, it certainly gives us the chills. Oh, yeah. So, The legacy of strange fruit. One of the things that uh, uh, can be said is that uh, Billie Holiday felt that this was her song. She often uh, ended her concerts with uh, with a song, with the, with the song "Strange Fruit." When Billie Holiday left uh, Society Cafe. Josh White was the person who took her place. Uh, White was more of a uh, folk singer. She was more of a jazz singer. White began playing Strange Fruit as well because the people uh, there were accustomed to it. And Billie Holiday came and she confronted Josh White and she said, this is my song. And uh, Josh White said, well, it's, it can be my song too. I mean, Josh White was a black man who was from the South. He was born in South Carolina. And he told Billie Holiday that when he was eight years old, he had seen two men who had been lynched. They were still hanging from a tree. So in 1942, he recorded a uh, folk version of this. And then for the most part, um, although Billie Holiday continued to sing it, and there were some instrumental versions, the song really was forgotten. But with the advent of the Civil Rights Movement, in 1963, Lou Rawls and Nina Simone, and Nina Simone's probably, I mean, some people have heard that version without ever hearing another version. Diana Ross uh, cut her version in 1972 when she performed as Billie Holiday in the movie Lady Sings the Blues. Um, and then there was a period of time, uh, UB40 and Susie and the Banshees are both uh, in the 80s. Those are both English groups. Uh, but then in the 90s, you can see that uh, people started recording the song again. And uh, recently, um, Katie Siegel uh, sang this song in, um, as part of a television show. And it's a show that I've never seen, but in, in looking into it, um, it's a show that appeared on FX TV. It was called Sons of Anarchy, and it had some of the greatest music. Um, uh, Strange Fruit, her version of it, ended se the seventh episode of season four. Kanye West in 2013 um, also he had only heard Nina Simone's version and he had part of Nina Simone's and he raps over it. And this was uh, on an album of his that, and he called that song Blood on the Leaves, which is a direct quote from Strange Fruit. Um, there's another song on the album in he, which he quotes Blood on the Leaves and that is a song called New Slaves. So it's obvious that Kanye West in 2013 was thinking heavily about the song Strange Fruit. And I have to say that 2013 was the year that the Black Lives Matter uh, movement started. Um, 
And I think that that had a lot to do with uh, Kanye West thinking about the song and uh, recording it in a couple ways. I'd like to play Renee Marie. I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old towns there are not in cotton. Look away. I ended that version, which mixes Dixie and Strange Fruit. And uh, I, I want to make some comments that tie up the various parts of the story that we, stories that we've talked about today. So first of all, Abel Mirapol. Uh, Mirapol is also famous for writing the lyrics to a song called The House I Live In. Music by Earl Robinson, who was also a member of the Communist Party uh, with uh, Mirapol. It became a hit for Frank Sinatra. It was made into a 10 minute movie with Sinatra and uh, uh, given an honorary Academy Award. The theme of that song was anti Semitism. Um, Mirapol is also famous for adopting two sons. Now you recall that he, his uh, pseudonym that he wrote under was for the sons that he never had. Well, later in life in the 1950s, he had that opportunity. He adopted the two sons of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg uh, who were executed as spies during the McCarthy period in 1953. You remember the name James Cameron. Um, he was released during that lynching, but he was later tried as an accessory before the fact to murder. He testified that Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith did in fact 
kill Claude Dieter. The woman who was uh, Dieter's girlfriend, Mary Bell, testified she had not been raped. Cameron served several years in prison and after his release, he became a civil rights activist. He founded three NAACP chapters in Indiana. He headed an Indiana State Agency for Civil Rights. And when he retired, he moved up to Milwaukee and founded America's Black Holocaust Museum, a museum that uh, in 1988, uh, focused on uh, lynching and um, other atrocities, <laughs> uh, Jim Crow laws, etc. It became a virtual museum in 2008. Billy Holiday, uh, Billy was born uh, Eleanor Fagan in Philadelphia. She grew up in Baltimore. She had a very, very difficult childhood. She dropped out of school at age 11. She was arrested with her mother for prostitution when she was 13 years old. She moved to New York City and she began singing, taking the name Billy for the actress Billy Dove. And she used Holiday for her father, Clarence Holiday. In 1935, she was signed by a talent scout and music producer, John Hammond, uh, who went on and signed many, many famous people. Teddy Wilson Orchestra. She was a vocalist for the Artie Shaw uh, swing band. Artie Shaw had an interracial band and in Billie Holiday's autobiography, she talks about what it was like to travel as a black singer with a predominantly white band. And that not only in the South, but often in the North, uh, they would not seat her with the band if they went into a restaurant. They would not allow her to be at the same hotel uh, that the rest of the band. She learned to stay on the bus and people would bring a meal out to her. So she was a well-known singer by the time she began singing at Cafe Society. Holiday's career suffered due to various addiction problems and it was very much exacerbated by racism and anti-communism. Now, Billie Holiday was not political in the way we think of political, but because she had identified, she was identified with a song written by a communist. The FBI followed her and harassed her. And um, that led, that just furthered her addiction problems. Uh, she died in 1959 at age 44. And, you know, right now it, uh, there is a, a movie out uh, the, the USA versus Billie Holiday, and, and it focuses on some of the legal problems, uh, and it focuses on her addiction problems. And although the movie's gotten terrible reviews, the actress in the movie is uh, up for awards right now. And so I think it's really uh, very timely that we're doing this, uh, that we're doing this show, this show today, this presentation. Uh, Billie Holiday is con considered to have had a seminal influence on jazz. Her vocal style was inspired by jazz instrumentalists, and she pioneered new ways of manipulating the phrasing and the tempos. Let's play Strange Fruit again in 1959. Strange Fruit. Strange 
southern trees that strange fruit blood on the leaves and blood at the root black bodies swinging in the summer breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Pastoral scene of the gallant south. The bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck. For the sun to run, for the tree to drop. Here is a strange and bitter. I think we can get into questions. Okay, thank you very much. My question is, in addition to strange fruit, what is your next other favorite topic? What's your next favorite topic? Um, in addition to strange fruit, uh, my next favorite topic is uh, a couple songs by Bob Dylan um, and how Bob Dylan influenced uh, his influence in the 1960s on the Black Panther Party. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Well, I have a funny-ish um, anecdote before we get started. Um, I discovered Billie Holiday in my 20s and one Christmas, um, you know, I still was doing Christmas lists at the time and I asked my dad for some CDs and uh, and Christmas morning or whenever I saw him came and he was like, oh, I had the hardest time finding CDs. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I kept saying, do you know where his music is? And I was like, oh, dad, you're embarrassing. So <laughs> he'll never watch this. So just know that he was very embarrassing that he didn't even know that it was a woman. Um, but I'm sure that was something that she contended with from time to time. Sandra and David Sokol say very interesting. I saw that. See that? Yeah. Hello, Sandra. Hello, David. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting that, that, um, Bob Dylan and Jeff Buckley, um, who I'm a big fan of both, uh, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan never covered the song, right? No, he did not. Okay. He wrote um, a song about lynching. Well, he, he yeah, that was one of his yeah. many um, songs that he wrote kind of on, um, you know, social activism topics. Yes. But uh, yes. yeah, Jeff Buckley is also super famous for covering um, Alleluia by- uh, Gorgeous, by Leonard Cohen. Version yeah. Of, yeah, so he really knows how to pick um, songs to cover that he can really put his own spin on but still also respect the song yes 
Carol Convoy says, interesting story of the facts I never knew about lynching. Yes. You know, I would say that uh, many, many people uh, don't know all that much. And uh, what I would say about myself, before I started doing research into it, my idea of lynching came out of Western TV shows or Western movies where a posse finds the rustlers and they take them to a tree um, and, and, you know, swat the horses and the guys are left hanging. And, and, sure. and that was what I thought. But, uh, you know, to find, to find that it was a social event, to find that the, the postmaster had to stop postcards being sent in the mail, uh, to find that lynchings were well documented, um, that um, well, just how much complacency there was that just that that nobody put a stop to. Nobody said this is wrong from the yeah. from the government to the police to okay. anybody. Th there would be you know, thousands of people, thousands of people witnessing this, and um, just. A horrific destruction of the bodies after the lynching. It didn't end there. Yeah. Um, and it took place all over the country. Yeah, misconceptions of where it was. Misconceptions all over the place. Uh, Susan McCauley, would you like to ask your question? You've got a great question, Susan. Hi. Hi, sure. I just wanted to um, Ask if you could talk a little bit more about sort of the public's reaction to the song to the extent the public the public heard it. Was did Billy was Billy Holiday's version ever recorded and distributed commercially? I mean, I know we have recordings because we heard them, but you know, distributed in the way that people would buy it. Yes, and so here's a, a few things that I'd like to say about that. Number one. Um, you can, if you look, uh, if you do research into American protest songs, you know, in the first half of the century, um, up, up until this song, mostly protest songs were sing-alongs. Uh, the IWW used to take uh, songs that were well known, and then they'd write new lyrics to it. Um, a lot of folk songs, were songs that people all sang together. Other songs were based on gospels, but that people all sang together. This was a completely different type of uh, protest song where this was not a sing-along. This was, you know, part of the, it, the power was the performance. Um, so right away, Co Columbia, um, records did not originally want to put this out. They didn't see that there was a market for it. But after uh, Billy Holiday left Cafe Society, or Society Cafe, after she left there, um, they realized that more people wanted to hear her version and that she was now traveling with it and making a name for herself. Uh, with this song. And so they did release it. Uh, it was not a blockbuster hit. Um, because this is not a song that uh, you feel like dancing to. This is not a song that you want as background music. This is a song that causes you to, it, it stops you. It stops you. And just as Barney Josephson said, he wanted people to think. Um, and so it, it put this into a different category as far as uh, uh, as far as music was. Yeah. Um, Janet Heisman asked, and I just answered it, is it possible to see the virtual museum um, that James Cameron founded? I went ahead and put posted a link um, to everybody. It's a very long link, but I, I'm, uh, I promise you it goes to something. You can also just Google America's Black Holocaust Museum, and you'll find a link to it there as well. Yeah. Well, I would, I'd like to also mention Billie Holiday recorded this several times. Um, and so just as 
uh, you know, there was a, a recording late 30s, early 40s. Uh, there was one in, you know, 1959. There were a couple in the 50s. Uh, she recorded this several times. Each time was slightly different. Um, and as I said, she had a strong identification with this, uh, with this song. Absolutely. We have a question from Lori Branda. Lori, you want to unmute and ask a question? First of all, thank you, Jim, so much. Amazing content that I never knew. But, and I would like to thank uh, Aaron and of course, Diane, but I'm just always curious and amazed if we have any Billie Holiday connections in Chicago, do we know where she may have performed? Uh, you know, I, I don't have that information. I, I'm just gonna say that. I, I don't have that information. That's probably something that uh, Mr. Google could help you with, Lori. Oh, um, sure, they could. And, yeah. and, you know, and it's something that right now I will look into because yeah. I'm always, you know, everybody, everybody comes to Chicago. That's <laughs> so, right. Well, especially during that time. Yeah, that was a big traveling. Because there was, there was both the downtown scene, but there was also a vibrant scene in the Bronstown area for black only performers and black only audiences. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that Billie Holiday could have played at both, uh, both downtown and on the south side. Thanks, Lori. Uh, uh, just, could I say one other thing? Lori was thanking you, Aaron, and thanking Diane. And I, and, uh, I, I want to uh, also thank uh, Susie Helfrich um, because without her, this wouldn't have happened. It's wonderful when our members recommend people. Um, here's a note from Deborah Edelman. I'm just going to read it because it's on the question. She mentions at the beginning, you talked about Abel Miracle, and yeah. she's just thanked you for giving information on that. She said he's an underappreciated person in the 20th century history, talented and committed in every way to social justice. I and agree that he's, he's underappreciated and not known well, and, and partly that's because, you know, he he wrote the, his songs under a, a different name, a pen name. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he should be widely known because his song in that short movie got an Academy Award and Frank Sinatra, uh, and known because of the Billie Holiday song. Um, and then to, to also... Uh, have that place in history to adopt the uh, the two sons of the Rosenbergs. Uh, you know, he, he was he was there at a couple crucial times. Yeah, you know, you sometimes you forget about the kids left behind when people are um, either put in jail or you know, yes, absolutely passed away. Um, I'm gonna never be able to speak Loretta Christensen again if I don't ask you this question because she asked me this in a separate email. So your class that yes. uh, Diane mentioned, yes. um, you're not teaching it currently, right? but um, when do you think you'll start up teaching it again? Do you know yet? Well, I, you know, to some extent that depends on the uh, college, you know, the, the, everything changed when uh, the pandemic came. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a fall, a, a fall only course. Okay. You know, I did it uh, eight, 2018, 2019. And, um, and, and then, you know, the pandemic changed everything. So I, I'm not interested in teaching online. And they really cut back on adjunct faculty uh, during that period of time, because they lost some students mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, so we'll have to see. <laughs> I'm sorry. So don't count on fall of 2021, but potentially no. fall of 2022. Correct. Yeah. And that you know what the the most remarkable thing is uh, that I was telling you before we started is you know we have also had to um, revise what we're doing and stuff, but. It all is just okay. It all works out and we're all still together and learning and stuff. So um, hopefully we'll be able to see you, but if not, we will when you're able to. Okay. Um, okay, I'm trying to see if I have any other questions. We got a comment. Um, 
Oh, David Sokol says part of the reason that the Rosenberg sons, um, they, they stayed out of the limelight. Well, I'm sure they did. Um, they probably just wanted to live a normal life. Um, say, oh, excuse me, Sandra says it's Sandra Sokol. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure it, changing your last name means you have a you know, regular life. You're going to do That's that. right. They, they um, were known as Miracles. You know, from the time they were adopted uh, to this day, they're known as Miracles, not as Rosenbergs. Wow, wow, that's interesting. All right, well, it's 2.30, so I'm gonna ask you if you have any last, um, uh, any, sorry if we didn't get to your, anybody's questions, but we are going to wrap up. Do you have any last comments, uh, Jim, before we say goodbye? You know, one of the things, if, if we had a longer period of time, I would have played more selections from the, the various people who did interpretations of this song. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, uh, UB40 is kind of a reggae uh, Caribbean beat. Uh, Susie and the Banshees is a kind of a, a goth um, electronic uh, mm -hmm. uh, version. Um, uh, a number of versions are much more uh, uh, rock infused. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you could find a version that will fit the kind of music that you like. <laughs> yeah, and see how the feeling of the words change yeah. a bit with the the that's sound. A, that's yes. a good. That's a good um, assignment for everyone watching to do something like that. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jim. It was so nice to have you. And, and thank you to Diane Moses and all of the program team. Uh, we still have about, about a month and a half of Monday programs. If you want to know what we have coming up, you can go ahead and go to our website, www.19thcentury.org, and see what is on the schedule. And if you want to help us keep on putting on amazing programs like these, you can go to our website, www.19thcentury.org. There's a donate here button. You can click on that and give us a donation and that'll help us continue these amazing programs. Well, for everyone at the 19th Century Charitable Association, hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. See you next time. Bye-bye.